They point to their own numbers, wealth, popularity, and look with contempt upon the advocates of truth as few, poor, and unpopular, having a faith that separates them from the world. My, talk about peer pressure. Tell me, if you were a preacher, would you walk away from the big, beautiful church? The thrill of administrating a large congregation? And what about the payroll? Would you risk walking away from that over small issues? Would you be willing to walk with a few, the poor and the unpopular, just because they're right in this or that? Continuing, notice the quote. Christ foresaw that the undue assumption of authority indulged by the scribes and Pharisees would not cease with the dispersion of the Jews. He had a prophetic view of the work of exalting human authority to rule the conscience, which has been so terrible a curse to the church in all ages. And his fearful denunciations of the scribes and Pharisees and his warnings to the people not to follow these blind leaders were placed on record as an admonition to future generations. Continuing, though the Reformation gave the scriptures to all, yet the same self-principle which was maintained by Rome prevents multitudes in Protestant churches from searching the Bible for themselves. They are taught to accept its teachings as interpreted by the church. Friend, is that what you've been taught? Rather than to think for yourself? The quote goes on, and there are thousands who dare receive nothing, however plainly revealed in the Scripture, that is contrary to their creed or the established teachings of their church. A lack of moral courage to step aside from the beaten track of the world leads many to follow in the steps of learned men. And by their reluctance to investigate things for themselves, they are becoming hopelessly fastened in the chains of error. Friends, what does hopeless mean to you? They see that the truth for this time is plainly brought to view in the Bible, and they feel the power of the Holy Spirit attending His proclamation, yet they allow the opposition of the clergy to turn them from the light. Oh, friends, that's a principle that's been almost forever. Don't let that happen to you. Ellen White's comments are clear enough. Certainly she does not say that all ministers are bad or we'd all be in trouble. But she clearly says where your responsibility lies. We're not to forsake what is right because of peer pressure, because of embarrassment, rejection, loneliness, false accusations, or even the rack for that matter. If it's right, do it as if all heaven were watching and no one else were all that important. Friends, to be hopelessly fastened in the chains of error can be likened to the blind leading the blind. And Christ says when it comes to that sort of thing, they both fall in the ditch. Please notice the text. Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Friends, what does a ditch represent? The ditch represents the place for the spiritually blind. Friends, the spiritually blind are not going to find their way into the kingdom. You know, every true minister will applaud the readings of these words of 2 Matthew 15, of Matthew 15. Every false minister will cringe as though he's being unfairly attacked. The truth is, Paul's teachings today will correct the incorrect pagan, pagan religious behavior if they're just given a chance. The only safe thing to do, dear one, is to weigh the evidence, scripture with scripture, text with text, here a little, there a little, and then let every man be convinced in his own mind to do the right thing. For a change of pace, I'm going to run the risk of exposing a little spiritual blindness here. Here goes. Some commentaries rationalize that Paul's converts must have first been converted to Judaism and therefore were returning to Jewish holidays, and that's what Paul was lamenting. 
But friends, the truth is clear enough. They were returning to the holidays of the no-gods, just like it says. Neither Jews nor converts to Judaism would ever call Yahweh a no-god. The text says, when ye knew not God, ye did service to them who are no-gods. But now after ye have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye you desire again to be in bondage? Friends, the text makes it crystal clear they did not know the true God during the time they were involved with the weak and beggarly elements of pagan worship. Be assured that our God is not a God of weak and beggarly elements. A few tapes ago, we studied a little bit about the 1888 controversy and how Ellen White championed two ministers, young ministers, A.T. Jones and, of course, uh, Wagner, E.J. Wagner. Well, I didn't say much about E.J. Wagner, but in a book, The Gospel of Galatians, by uh, Elder Wagner, on page 50, he does a lot of quoting of J.N. Andrews to prove a point. And one of the things that uh, Brother Wagner wrote is this, quote, If the connection be read from verses 8 through 11, it will be seen that the Galatians, before their conversion, were not Jews, but heathen. And that these days, months, times, and years were not those of the Levitical law, but those which they had regarded with superstitious reverence while heathen. You see, many people have known through the ages, including A.T. Jones and, and, and Wagner, that these things didn't refer to Jewish laws or regulations or things of the Leviticus program at all. These were heathen days, heathen customs, people who had not been converted to Judaism, but converted from heathenism to Christianity. In fact, Jeremiah, the prophet, set the issue perfectly straight. Notice what he said in Jeremiah 10, 2-4. He says, learn not the ways of the heathen. Well, dear ones, I think that's exactly what we have done. For the customs of the people are vain. But we're very grateful for new light. And the fourth angel is beginning to shine. I call him the fourth angel because he follows the third and, 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 and gives power to the third. But in actuality, if you actually count the angels, the first, second, and third angel, Revelation 14, and count the rest of the way through, the angel of Revelation 18 is the seventh. We call him the fourth because he enforces the third angels. But, Literally, he's the seventh. Seventh is completion. You may be listening to that final message to come the rest of the way out of Babylon. So let's not study further about pagan services nor their holidays on which they were performed. Instead, let's look a little closer at the word the Scripture uses to designate heaven's holy days. Now, most of you know that the primary word for a feast or a set time is moed, M-O-E-D, or in the plural, it's moedim. I want you to notice this picture that says the Hebrew word is first made obvious as it's to its meaning in Leviticus 23. You see that? In that chapter, heaven's appointed times or feasts are interpreted from the word moed. So, so let's just read it and see where that moed is in the text. Here we go. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them concerning the moedim of the Lord, or the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my moedim, my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation, and beautiful it is. Ye shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Obviously, the Sabbath is one of his most holy moedim. Verse 4, These are the feast or moedim of the Lord, even holy convocations which ye shall claim in their seasons. Now let's continue with verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the moed of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. 